Okay, Rabbi Good evening. Welcome. Let's talk tonight about our discussion, which is going to be about the importance and the benefit of having everybody should have a rabbi. Every Jew should have a rabbi. So, uh, where do we see right uh, this concept of having a rabbi? We already actually touched on it a few weeks ago when we talked about Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers. Over there it says, right, rav istalek min asafek. Right? What does that mean? You should make yourself a rabbi. Get your get yourself a rabbi. You know, get a rabbi. So, what's the reason why? It tells you, right, because you have to remove yourself from doubts. This is the reason why. What 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 does that mean? It, uh, the obvious meaning is like this, right? That uh, a person, when he's going through life, he has all kinds of predicaments and situations that he goes through. So what happens is, right, that. Uh, He's not sure, you know, which way is the right path to go. Is it this path, you know, the path number one, highway number two, highway number five, right? Uh, Long Island Expressway, you know, the Turnpike, whatever, all kinds of things. The, the, the Parkway, which way should I go, right? Uh, so a person always has a choice. He's always uh, has dilemmas going on in his life, no matter what it is, right? Every, every, every situation in life involves some kind of a dilemma. Should I do this? Should I do that? What should I do? How should I do it? I'm not really sure. So, there are people who know who don't have a rabbi. So, what do they do? They just like, you know, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, you know, they flip a coin, whatever. They do whatever they feel like, you know, whatever, whatever they think is right. But sometimes, what happens is, right, that because the person doesn't have a rabbi, so he does, the, he makes the wrong decision, and because of that, like, he can get into trouble. You know what I mean? What does that mean? That uh, he makes a big mistake in life, which also can involve sins as well. And therefore, what happens is, right, that uh, now this is going to blemish him for all his life. He's going to be blemished all his life because of that. Because who knows if he's ever going to correct that or come back or the damage that it does, right, how it will be possible to rectify the damage. You know what I mean? So a person <coughs> has to have a rabbi, especially if a person is not so knowledgeable in Torah. He's not so educated. So, you know, the less a person has a knowledge and understanding, the more he needs a rabbi, you know, uh, close by, you know, by his side all the time. I remember when we were, when I was uh, you know, starting out, in my, in my youth, youthful days, we're talking about when I was, uh, you know, like 21, 22, and uh, after that also got married at the age of 28. And then also, after that few years, I always had a rabbi that I used to call, you know, whatever. Sometimes it was this rabbi, you know, depending on the place that I lived or whatever, the, the situation that I was in, whatever. Always there was there was somebody or somebody to call. Do you need one now? So that's a good question. Do I need one now? Uh, I'll try to answer you this question. Uh, it's a good question, actually, a very good question. So, but before we get to that, just to explain, right, that I used to, when I needed that, that time, I needed like a full time rabbi, you know what I mean? Because I didn't know what I was doing. I don't know. I mean, the truth is that a person learns all kinds of concepts in Torah, he learns all kinds of. Right principles in Torah, but if a person is not expert so much in these things, he doesn't really know how to apply them to the right situation, to the right predicament. He doesn't know how to match up the information with the situation. This, you know, you need like a professional to do that. You know what I mean? Somebody who's like a professional rabbi. So therefore, right, a person needs to appreciate why he's, he needs a rabbi. If you appreciate how much why you need one, you know, right, that how every decision in life can bring you to all kinds of crossroads, and if you go on the wrong path, it can take you right down all the way to the wrong path altogether, you know what I mean? And then, it may take you years to come back, if ever, that you come back. You may have to wait till the next lifetime also, you know what I mean? If you made a big mistake, you took the wrong turn, you know what I mean? There's the, you know, there's the famous case, right, in Israel, that over there, right, you have the Israel proper, and you have also territories, you know, where the, those wild animals live over there, right? The ones who call themselves religious, you know. But they're wild animals. That's what they are. So what happens is if you take the wrong turn off the highway, you know, and go, you go to their, you know, wild animal zoo, that zoo over there, right? What happens is they'll, they'll lynch you. They'll kill you right there, you know, because you're a Jew. You know what I mean? That's what they do. If you take one wrong turn, one wrong exit, you understand? And you get lynched. And nobody can save you from them, you know? Like, God knows what's going to be, right? It happened several times already. No Jews. Right? They also, uh, soldiers were lynched like that. Can you imagine? Soldiers. And they were armed with guns. So it doesn't help you, you know? When you have 20 people, you know, swarming on you, these animals over there, they're animals, these people. And they call them, you know, peacemakers. Well, they, they say, make peace with them. You can't make peace with animals. They're mafia, these people. You know what I mean? They're killers. 
There's no, you cannot make peace with people who act like animals, you know, like wild animals, like beasts of the field. That's what they are, these people. They're not, they're not, they're not human beings, right? Uh, they, they say they're religious and they pray, you know. What are they praying for? To, to kill people, you know. They kill each other. They kill, the, they kill everybody else also, you know. Everybody they can get their hands on, they kill. They kill their own family also. These people, you know what I mean? That's what they do, right? They, they kill their own daughter. They'll kill their own, own wife. You know, if something is going wrong, they kill them. They, don't, they have no guilt about it. And they think it's a mitzvah also, you know. Can you imagine? They're like wild animals, these people. Anyway, the point is, right, that uh, this is what we're living with. You understand? We're living with these kind of people. And then, then they say, oh, you know, making peace. How can you make peace with, with these wild animals, with these mafia, you know, savages. these savages? They're savages. That's what they are. They have no, they have, they have no human, human compound in them. They have nothing. No humanity with these people. I like when they back from J.C. Human sewage. They couldn't even build a tent on a desert. <laughs> All they know is how to hate Jews and molest camels. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, very interesting. All right, that's a nice, nice quote. Okay, very robust. It's a very robust quote. Okay. All right. You know. So anyway, right, getting back to what we said. This, why do I use this allegory? To tell you, right? Because a person who takes the wrong decision in life because he doesn't have a rabbi, it's the same thing. You know what I mean? You can go on the wrong path, go a sweet, veer off, you know, and go on the wrong path altogether. And it can, it can destroy him, you know, kill his life. You can destroy his life like that. Look, that's, that's the idea, you know what I mean? A person doesn't realize how critical decisions are in life until he understands, right, what's Torah, what are these things involved, all these kinds of things like this, right? Uh, so a person has to know that it's a, really having a rabbi... In, in truth, it's a life and death situation. You know, a person can destroy himself if he doesn't, if he doesn't have a rabbi. Hashem should save us. This is, the, this is the idea. But a person who's well learned in Torah, you know, somebody who has good knowledge, good education, he studied Torah, you know, and uh, he's not just doing it for business, you know, like uh, you know, some people that we know, as you know, right? They're just doing it for money. That's something else, right? We're not talking about people like that. Because people who do it for money, they always come up with the wrong answer, you understand? You should know that it says in Zerah Kadosh that there's 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 several types of rabbis in this world, you know, all kinds of rabbis. But the one who really is the, has the merit to come up with the, with the proper answer, you know who it is? The one who does Torah lishma. What does that mean? For the sake of heaven, he does it, not to make a living or just to do a business, whatever, you know. That doesn't mean, by the way, he's not getting a salary. That's not the issue. If he's getting a salary or not, I'm not talking about that. The question is, what is his intention? You know, to to do this job. Is, is his main intention to spread Torah, right, to to educate people, damadli you know, jamat, you know, to give them zechut, to give them merits, to, to, to give them uh, zechut, zechuyot. That, if that's his intention, he always comes up with the right answer. Because Hashem helps him to come up with the right answer. Because rachaman ali babai, Hashem wants, desires what's in the heart. So if a person has good things in the heart, what happens is, right, all his answers are good. But if he has something, he has tina belibo, what does that mean? He has polluted heart. A person who is, you know, tricky and crafty, you know. Snake, you know. One of those crafty, sneaky people, you know. Curvy, going around here and there, going all kinds of tricks. Their intention is not to spread Torah. Their intention is just to make a, make a living, to make money, you know, or to get kavod, to have honor, to all kinds of things you like this. different rabbis to find, find the right <laughs> Sure, sure, yeah. That's quite a... Quite a trip, right? This kind of thing. But anyway, about time, getting back to what we said. Uh, so, per, so having a rabbi is a very, very, very crucial yeah. thing. Without that, a person, Hashem should have mercies, right? God knows where he's going to wind up, right? He, as, as you know, that that town over there, their, their capital, these savages, you know what it is over there, right? Ramallah, Ramallah, you know, Machshemam. So if you wind up in Ramallah, you go make the wrong turn. <laughs> This is what happens, you know what I mean? The same thing applies to life as well, you know? Life has all kinds of dilemmas that you have to make the right decision. This is the idea. Okay, you get the idea. So anyway, getting back to what we said, uh, that having having a rabbi, the truth is, right, it's, a, it's, a, it's also, the question is, who do you choose for a rabbi? How do you know which one to choose? You know what I mean? This is also a very big question. And how do you know who's right and wrong? Because rabbis always have disputes, you know what I mean? This rabbi says like that, comes some other rabbi and says something else. How do I know which one is right? How do I know which one is wrong? What, I'm supposed to be the judge of who's right and wrong? There are some people, by the way, who have a corrupted system right now with, with, with rabbis. What they do is like this, right? There are, I've rebuked, by the way, some people that do this. 
they have the wrong kind of approach to, to having a rabbi. You know what they do? They go take like a census of rabbis, you know, they take a poll. They go to this rabbi, ask him. They go to another rabbi, ask him also. Then they go to the third rabbi, right? The rabbi number four, rabbi number five. And they come up with like several different answers. And, you know, then they make the decision who's right and who wrong. They're the ones who decide. You know what I mean? So if that's the case, in the end, you're going to decide who's right and wrong. So what do you need a rabbi for? You know what I mean? That's not what a rabbi is for. The rabbi is, you should, you should listen to him. Not to decide yourself. If you take a poll of census of several rabbis, and then you decide on your own, so what's, what's the point, right? You're the one who's making the final decision, not the rabbi. You know? So then why, what do you need a rabbi like that for? The truth is, right, that there are some people who are qualified to do this kind of a thing, though. What are we, what are we saying, right? There are people, like it says in the Chuba of the Rashba. The Rashba talks about this. Who is Rashba? Rabbi Shlomo ben Aderet, right? One of the great rabbis of the medieval era talking about uh, 700 years ago, approximately. So it says the Rajbah, let's say you have right, two different rabbis. One is arguing with the other. So which one do you go like? Right, Two great rabbis, you know? Two great rabbis of generation, or, or the former generations. And, and you, you don't know who's right and wrong. One says like this, one says like that. You know, like we have the Rif and the Rambam and the Rosh, and we have the Tosfot, and we have the Ran, and we have all these great rabbis. Each one says something else. So what do you do? So it says... Says the Rashba, the way, the way what you're supposed to do like this, right? You should, if if there's a dispute between two great rabbis, if one is bigger than the other, he's known to be bigger than the other rabbi, so you should go like the bigger rabbi. This is the idea, you know. Go like the bigger one. You know why? Because chances are more because of his great knowledge, he's going to be more right than the other. He's more deep. He has more knowledge. He has more. He's more well-rounded. He's you know he's got more uh, right. Uh, he's got more general a wide right wide wide approach to these things he knows everything he knows all the angles he knows how to come up with the right answers so if one rabbi is bigger than the other says the rashba you should go like the bigger rabbi you know so if uh, <laughs> he's funny okay so if, but if you have two rabbis that they're more or less equal you know, one big rabbi, one other big rabbi. Who, how do I know who's bigger? I don't know. How do I, what do I know about these things? You know what I mean? They're both great. They're both great rabbis of generation. How do I know who's bigger? So in a case like that, says the Rashba, if it's something which is the question you're t- dealing with, it's from the Torah, so you should be stringent, like the stringent opinion. You know? But if it's something which is for rabbinical, so there you can go like the lenient opinion. Right? Because we have a rule. Safek de raita le chumra, safek de rabbanan de hakel. What does that mean? But if, if the doubt is from the Torah, you have to be machmir, you have to be stringent. If the doubt is from the rabbis, you can be lenient. Right? This is, this is the idea. So this is what the Rashba, how, this is how it delineates uh, right, this, this idea. But in order to understand this Rashba, a person has to know one thing. What do you have to know? That uh, that only applies, what the Rashba is saying, if you yourself also are, are learned enough to go and study, you know, these opinions, and you know, get this one and get that one, and then you are able to like make a decision, render a decision according to these rules that we just delineated right now. But if you're not on that level to do that, right, you don't know how to open up these books and find out what this one said and what that one said. You're not a rabbi. You're not a scholar. You're not, you know, you're not on that level. So then, what do you do then? Right? That's the that's the question. So then, that's something else. What should a person do if he's not on that level at all? So then, he should pick one rabbi and go like him all the time. You know, pick one rabbi of this generation that he trusts. He's known to be, right, he's known in the society, in the Jewish society, in the religious society. He's known to be a person who's very knowledgeable, right, very very God-fearing rabbi as well, right? If he's not God-fearing, as we said before, not worth anything. Just knowledge is not good enough, right? You have to have also fear of God. So if a person has both fear of God and knowledge, and he has also a tradition that he got from his rabbis, he learned from the great rabbis of the generation, so a person like that, you can pick him, he's going to be your guide, and whatever he says you do, right? And you don't know what he's telling you. You don't know if it's right or wrong, you have no idea. But you're relying on his knowledge, on his expertise. This is the idea. You understand? This is, this is, the, real, this is the way it works. So, what does that mean? That if a person now, right, says the Rashba something amazing. What about if that rabbi made a mistake, though? Let's say, right, that rabbi happened to make a mistake. Everybody, everybody's a you know a human being. Sometimes rabbis also make mistakes. So even if he's a big rabbi, let's say, right, he made a mistake, and you're going according to what he says and everything. 
So there are some things that you may be doing the wrong way because he told you the wrong thing. So then who gets the sin over here, right? Is the sin from the rabbi? The rabbi gets the sin or the the one who asked the question he gets the sin? Who got the sin over here, right? So says Rashba, since you're not knowledgeable and you're relying on this rabbi, so the truth is he gets the, he gets the sin. You understand? He's the one. So what does that mean? That if you ask the rabbi and he gave you the wrong answer, so the sin really goes on the rabbi and not on you. This is the idea. You understand? This is this is the this is the this is the this is the way it works. So therefore, what does that mean? That if a person has a rabbi and he asks him questions about these things about Judaism and life, what all kinds of things, so he's absolving himself from being punished. Why is that? Because now the, the responsibility is on the rabbi, not on him. The rabbi is telling me what to do. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I do whatever he tells me to do. That's the idea, you know? That's the idea. And then now responsibility is on his shoulders, not on my shoulders. This is the idea, you know? So this is a, a very good way to absolve yourself also from being punished about things that you did wrong. Why? Because I asked the rabbi, listen, I did my duty. I did my obligation. I went and asked the rabbi. And now, right, it's in his hands. It's not in my hands anymore. I don't know. I don't know how to make these decisions. I don't know how to render decisions in halakha. How do I know these things, right? So this is also uh, one of the things that uh, a person absolves himself like that from having a rabbi. So what are we saying, Rabbi Taib? That it really depends on the person, right? If a person is not on level, the bottom line is like this, right? If a person is not on level to render dishes himself, he's not enough, he cannot study these opinions and go in and find out what this one said and what that one said. If he's not on that level, so what he should do is find one rabbi who's known to be knowledgeable, good reputation, God-fearing, everything, right? He has a tradition. He learned with the, with the great rabbis of a generation. Somebody like that. So then you find somebody like that and you're, you're in his hands. So now he's responsible for everything. But if a person has enough knowledge to decipher, to go in and decipher what this rabbi said and that rabbi said, so then he should go according to the rules that we just delineated. What does that mean? Sometimes you should be stringent. Sometimes you should be right. You should be uh, lenient according to the rules that we just said. What does that mean? Right, Depending on which rabbi is bigger, or which, if, if, if the question is from the Torah, or if the question is from the rabbi. This is the idea, you understand? This is the way it works. Okay, very good. So, now, right, I want to tell you something a little bit uh, deeper regarding this. What does that mean? That the truth is, right, having a rabbi has much more significance than what we just said now. It's even something deeper than that. Right, there's, there's a verse, you know, in the... Uh, that says like this. There's a verse that says, right? What does that mean? That your eyes should be looking at your teacher. What does that mean? That a person, right, should... Simple ideas like this. When you're studying Torah from your rabbi, you should also be looking at his face. Look at him. Why is that? Because looking at his face gives you, right, a certain influence of holiness. That that influence, right, raises you, your spiritual level, it makes you into a better person, it makes you into a better Jew, makes you into a more God-fearing Jew. This is what happens. This is the idea, you know? So a person should always try to look at his rabbi because the influence, the visual influence of looking at your, at your rabbi is also something very great. A person should not waver on that. But here, right, what we see uh, there's also something in the Gemara regarding this. You know what they say, right? It says in the Gemara, uh, it says in the Gemara like this, right? It says Rabbi Yudha Nasi, one of the great rabbis of the generation of that time, which was after the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. He was also president of the, of the high court, right? Uh, Rabbi Yudha Nasi, from, descended from King David. He writes over there that why was he Zohar, right? Why, where he had the merit to become such a great rabbi that the halacha was, is like him. In most cases, it says in the Gemara, that if the dispute between Rabbi Danasi and the rest of the generation, halacha is always like him from the other rabbis. So why did he, how did he become so wise like that? So he says, the reason I became so wise is one thing. That when I used to look, go to the lecture of my rabbi, Rabbi Meir, I used to look at him the influence of looking at him is what gave me the greatness that I have. The greatness of looking at my rabbi. So, the only thing is like this, right? That he said, I really wasn't looking at him though directly, in, in frontally, on his face. So what was I looking at? I was looking at the back of his head. Why is that? Because the where, 
the place that he was sitting was not in front of Rabbi Meir, his rabbi. He was in the back. So he was not looking at his face frontally, just looking at the back of his head and the neck, you know? So he said, even that, even though this is not the real influence, the real influence is not the frontal, the, the back influence. The real influence is the frontal influence of the face. But nevertheless, right, the influence was so great from Rabbi Meir that even the back of his head had a great influence. And therefore, right, because of that, he was able to become uh, the great rabbi that he did. Why? Because at least he was looking at the back, if not the front. And if he looked at the front, he would have been even in greater. This is the idea. You understand? This is the... This is, this is the... This is the idea. So therefore, right, a person should never uh, waive the, the zechut, right, the merit of looking at his rabbi, because that gives him a holy influence and it elevates his soul, right? A person should not uh, give that up. He should be always uh, desiring to be in the company of his rabbi, to see his face, to look at him. Uh, now I'll tell you something, right, which it says in the Zohar Kadosh, something deeper about this even. This is something really amazing. It says in Zerah Kadosh like this, regarding this issue. Where is this? In Parshat Vayeshev, right? Which talks about Yosef HaTzadik, over there. It says, Tachaze, hai man de istakal be ma de olif merabe, techa mele be'ahu ruchmeta, yachil lit osfa be'ahu rucha yati. Right? So it says in Zerah Kadosh, that if a person is learning something from his rabbi, right? And now let's say, okay, he learned it from him already, but the rabbi already passed away. He's not with us anymore, you know? He's, he went to Gan Eden, he went to the next world. He died already, that's it. The rabbi died. So now the question is like this, right? What do you do once your rabbi dies? Do you still Are you still considered to have a rabbi or not? Or you have to find now a different rabbi? You know what the problem is, right? People do this, always ask me, right? Uh, they ask me. They say, tell me, you know, this is what David mentioned, right? Uh, you know David mentioned, right? He said, uh, "Do you have, do you have a, do you have a rabbi now? Also, do you need a rabbi also?" So you know what I tell people when they ask me this question? They say, "Do you have a rabbi?" You know what I tell them? I said, "My rabbi was Rabbi He was the greatest rabbi of the generation." So what does that mean? What's what's the practical thing? The practical thing is like this, right? That uh, a person, even though his rabbi has already passed away. He still can get influence, holy influence from his rabbi. How does he get holy influence from him? What does he have to do? So says the Zerah Kadosh, right? The thing you have to do is like this, right? You have to be. After you learn something from your rabbi, you have to be envisioning. Um, you have to be envisioning his face in your conscience, even though he's not with you anymore. But you have to remember how he looks. How his face used to look, right? Today it's easier to, it's easy, very easy to do that. You know why? Because we have, uh, we have pictures and we have videos of our rabbis now nowadays, right? Not like the old days where we didn't have any of those things. Maybe we had one portrait if we're lucky, you know, some in, inaccurate portrait. Now we have the videos and pictures, so we can actually see them very, very well, even though they're not with us. So therefore, what a person should do, right? If a person wants to I understand something in the Torah on a deeper level, what he should do is remember. The visual influence of his rabbi, the, how he looks, how he looked, and if he does that and he tries to understand a certain Torah passage, he will understand much better because of that. This is the idea. This is the idea. So can you imagine, right? This is a person. A person does when when he when he gets he, so he can contact his rabbi even though he's not alive. All he has to do is to envision him and try to understand what he learned from his rabbi. Keeping his, his his facial facial image in, in his mind, and what he does is right that elevates him into understanding much deeper to a much deeper level. This is something, by the way, that a person uh, can also do very well if he does what they say, right? That there's a way that a person can actually bring the presence of his rabbi onto him, even though his rabbi is not alive anymore. What should he do? What he does is like this, right? He learns his books. Let's say his rabbi wrote books, right? He was a big rabbi, so he wrote some sfarim, he wrote some, some works in halakha or whatever, some other types of topics. So what he does is, right, if he studies the works of his rabbi. Uh, Shalom. We cannot have two drashot in one time. I'm sorry, mechila. Zemafriya, mamash. Zemafriya. En kavod, mechila, you know? It's not nice, you know, what you're doing. 
זה לא, זה לא מכובד, ממש. לא מכובד. מחילה. זה, כן, אז... מחילה. אוקיי, so... What I'm saying is like this, right? That a person, once he envisions... Uh, once a person envisions his rabbi like that, and he also studies his works as well, what happens is, right, that this elevates him very, very greatly, and they say there's also another thing which is involved, which is that a person comes, that person, that rabbi, that he studies his works, even though he's not alive anymore, what happens is that his soul comes and helps him. He comes and he assists him. If he has problems in his life, all kinds of issues that he needs to deal with, that rabbi comes and helps him. And even though, by the way, this also applies if that rabbi was not his rabbi. But because he learns the works of that rabbi, nevertheless, he gets assistance from the neshama of that rabbi. This is what happens. So what happens is, right, that uh, a person, by doing this kind of trick of connecting with his rabbi through envisioning his countenance, his face, and also... Uh, Right, learning his, his works in, in uh, his books, what happens is right that um, this way a person can still have a rabbi even though he's not alive. Can you imagine? This is the way to do it by envisioning his, him visually and also right understanding his uh, works that he wrote, things that you'd study from him. This is from by by this way, a person can. Uh, connect with, with the greatness of his rabbi, and this elevates him. So comes the Zohar Kadosh and tells us, practically speaking, right, that this is exactly what happened with Yosef HaTzadik. Now this is something amazing, right? What it says is like this, right? That Yosef HaTzadik, once he got out of jail, and Paro took him out, so what happened was like this, right? That he had to now come to Paro, and he had to interpret the dreams of Paro, right? Paro had some dreams that he had, and he was supposed to be an interpreter for him. So how did he get to this level of interpreting the dreams of Paro? Because when he was in jail, he interpreted also dreams of his ministers that were there in jail because of the, some sins that they did, some transgressions that they did. So the question is like this, right? Nazar Kadosh teaches you something amazing over here. How is it that Yosef HaTzadik knew how to interpret the dreams of these two people who were in jail with him over there? How did he know? How did, how did he, able, why was he able, how was he able to do that, right? We would think... Oh, maybe it was Racha Kodesh, you know, it was, he had divine inspiration. So was it that? So Zor Kodesh is telling you, no, not, not exactly. He did all this with the wisdom of the Torah. That's how he interpreted the dreams. What does that mean? So it says like this, right, that um, he, uh, he heard the first dream of the first minister. So what did he start talking about, right? This first minister, the first thing he said to Yosef HaTzadik was like this. I says I was looking at a at a at a, a grapevine, right? This is the idea. So once Rabbi Yosef Sadiq uh, heard this, that this minister is talking about a grapevine, so he was very baffled by that. Why? Why was he baffled? What's the reason why? The reason he was baffled is because grapes have two connotations. It doesn't have only one kind of connotation. It can have a positive connotation. It can also have a negative connotation. So what does that mean? There are some verses in the Bible that interpret grapes in a positive way, and there are some verses that interpret in a negative way. So Yosef HaTzadik was not sure, right? He said, oh my God, he's talking about grapes, you know? I don't know how to interpret this because it has two connotations. It can have a positive connotation and have a negative connotation. So the question is, what? How does this come out, right? What? Uh, what? What? How do we? Uh, how do we solve this problem? So you know what happened was once he continued to talk to the minister. So he said there was three vines in this in this grape in these grapes. There was three vines. This is the idea. So once Yosef Atzadik heard that that there was three vines, he understood. That this was a very it was it was a positive dream. How was that? It was actually positive for him also himself, not only for 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 this person. We're talking about himself. That this dream was coming to tell Yosef Atzadik something good about himself as well. How did he know that? Because once he said three vines, he knew right that this was coming to allude 
to what? He was coming to allude to the three forefathers, the patriarchs of the P- Am Yisrael, Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. And so once he heard that, he said, oh, now I know. This is a good dream. This is something to t- coming to tell me something good. So therefore, what he did was, right, he said, ah, it must be, right, that now I have to get in touch with my rabbi. What does that mean? His rabbi was his father, Yaakov Avinu. But Yaakov Avinu was in Eretz Israel. He was in Mitzrayim. So he wasn't able to talk with him over there, to ask him a question or anything like that, to, to take counsel with him. So what did he do? You know what he did? He envisioned him in his mind, his face, his countenance of his, of his father. And this is exactly what helped him to interpret these dreams. He was able to get into a deeper mode of wisdom like that by envisioning the, the countenance of his father. This is the idea. So, what happens is like this, right? That um, Rabbi, we're going to vote you Rabbi of the Year, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to vote you guys the, the, the sleepy, sleepy, sleepy uh, students. Wrong. The sleepy students of the year. <laughs> okay. Hainu <laughs> kecholomim. You know, there's a, there's a verse like that, in, uh, right? Uh, in, in the, in the Tehillim. That it says that we, we were like dreamers, you know. It's, uh, we're going to be redeemed. When Mashiach comes, we're like dreaming, you know. I think you guys are always dreaming now, before Mashiach comes. <laughs> okay. So anyway, as we said, right, that Yosef HaTzadik was able to interpret the dream. You know how? As we said, because he, he, he visually, he visualized his father, who was his rabbi. Even though his, his rabbi was not there, his father was not there, but in ter- because he visualized him, he was able to connect with him and a- able to solve the dreams and to interpret the dreams. Something unbelievable, right? So then, right, he's, since this minister told him, he said, listen, you know, I had three vines. And he told him all kinds of things like this. And then once Yosef HaTzadik heard these things, he said, oh, you know, I know what this is coming to tell me. It's not coming to tell me about him. It's coming to tell me about myself. Right. You know what that means? It's coming to tell me that I'm going I'm to be sprung out of jail. Right? That now I'm going to have a salvation over here. He was in jail for, for, for 12 years already. So this was, you know, it, at that time it was 10 years. Altogether he was in jail for 12 years. Can you imagine? So what happened was, right, that now he realized because of this allusion of these words that what? That it was three vines. And also, you know what? There was also another illusion there. You know what the other illusion was? The other illusion was that it was, they were talking about white grapes. Right? There's a difference between white and black. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, can you go and I'm sorry to bother you, but open the open the door. He just closed it. This jackass who just closed. Okay, close the yeah, close that. Okay. So uh, that's his uh, that's his way of thanking us. Okay. So uh, <laughs> excuse the expression. I'm sorry. You get you get curse. Yeah. Make sure it's open. Okay. Very good. Can you push it? Push it. See if it's open. Make sure. There you go. Okay. There you go. Just to let him know when he looks back. <laughs> Okay. Then with their door, it's like nothing else annoys me like they can only be. Those okay, doors, I tell they open all the time. Yeah. The sanctuary. No. Okay. So anyway, getting back to what we said, right? Uh, that Yosef HaTzadik, as we said, he was able to envision that this was a sign, as we said, also because there were white grapes. Because says the Kadosh, right? There's two types of grapes that a person sees in a dream. There's white grapes and black grapes. So white grapes are a good sign. And black grapes are a bad sign. So that means something is bad there. You understand? So since this minister told Yosef HaTzadik that there was white grapes, so therefore he said, ah, it must be something good over here, right? I'm going to be sprung from, from jail. You understand? So two things over here, right? One was, they told him about three vines, which were talking about the forefathers and also Am Yisrael, Jewish people, who were made up of three groups, right? Kohen, Levi, and Israel. So he took this to, as an illusion that something, something good is going to be. There's going to be salvation. But this was about himself he was talking about. So then, the minister starts to talk about something else. right? He started about talking about continuing the dream. But the rest of the dream was actually about him, the, the minister himself. What does that mean? That he was going to be reinstated to his job. He's going to be right, giving back. He's going to be bringing the cup and giving it to Paro, oh, serving the cup. He was a cup bearer. He was a bartender, this guy. You understand? For Paro. He was a bartender, you know, royal bald bartender. So what happens was, right, uh, that now he's going to be reinstated because it says, right, I'm, I was serving the cup to par- Oh, so Yosef HaTzadik said, ah, you know, this dream is very good. It's a, it's a double whammy over here, right? Two brothers, one stone. 
it's good for me and it's also good for him. That's the idea. You understand? This is the, this is the idea. So this is the way he was able to interpret. How was he able to go into the depths of interpreting dream by visualizing his father Yaakov Avinu, who was his, also his rabbi. This is the idea. Something amazing, right? So we see from here that a person can also have a rabbi after he already, already passes away. How is that? By studying his books, remembering what he learned from him, and also by visualizing his his countenance as well. This is the idea, you know. This is the this is the way. So uh, goes on to say. By the way, there's a there's a story about this which I heard from one of the big rabbis in Yerushalayim, Rabbi Musafi. He said that the what that uh, the great Rabbi Ezra Atia, right, who was uh, mm-hmm. the Rosh Hashiva of um, Parat Yosef, great Sephardi. Yeshiva in Jerusalem, right, which was around for a long time already. So he said, right, that he was always he was very uh, strin- he was very uh, particular. This rabbi, Rabbi Rezatia, always used to tell the students, when you study the Talmud, study also the Perush, the the, the commentary of the Marsha, one of the great rabbis, right, of the commentators on the Talmud, the Marsha. So he used to tell them, don't study the Talmud without Marsha. Always have to have Marsha, whatever you do, right. So what happened was, right, that. Uh, because of that, he himself was studying Marsha, and also all the students were studying Marsha in, in the yeshiva. So what happened was that what they say, right, that if a person does that, that on a regular basis he learns a book of a certain rabbi, you know, the, this great rabbi, whatever, that rabbi comes and helps him, even though he's not in this world anymore. His neshama comes, and if he has some kind of a situation, he needs to be helped, he comes and helps him. That's what happens, you know. So therefore, right, a good, a good advice for a person, a person who wants to be helped by these great rabbis, who already passed away from the world, is what to learn their book. If he studies their book, what happens is that any author of those of those books that he studies regularly, they come and help him. So this is exactly what happened right to this rabbi. That one day his wife was sick, you know, and she was like on a very deadly ill. She was very, you know, in a bad, bad bad situation. He was already an old man himself. So what happened was he was very worried about his wife, you know, maybe is she gonna make it, not gonna make it, like what's gonna be, right? So what happened was that because of the worry that he had one time he was studying, you know, and he fell asleep. So what happened was that uh, he fell asleep. All of a sudden he gets tapped on his shoulder like this, you know. Hello, hey, wake up. So he says, huh, huh, what, what? So he wakes up, you know. He says, who are you? So he says, oh, he says, you know who I am. I'm the rabbi that you study his book all the time. And all the, all the yeshiva studies his book over there, Marsha. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm that rabbi. I came to visit you. The white grapes. Can you imagine? The white grapes, right? So he came to visit him. So uh, he said, uh, what, "Okay, so what? Uh, what do you want to tell me?" So he says, "I'm, I'm came to tell, give you good news. Your wife is gonna be healed, right? She's gonna be, have, she's gonna be healed. She's, she's not gonna die. She's gonna survive. She's gonna be have a refuge lemma." So therefore, he was happy. He said, "Oh, thank you." You know. So what we see from there, also there's another story like that, you know, which I heard also from the same rabbi. Can you imagine? This is a, a true story, according to tradition. It's unbelievable the story. They say, right, that. Uh, there was a person who used to learn every day, read every day. He was not a learned person, like a learned rabbi or whatever. But there are people who are Jews who are not learned. But you know what they do? They uh, they study, uh, they read Tehillim every day. They read Tehillim. It makes their soul feel good, you know, the neshama. It's, good. it's a good feeling. Especially women, they do this, you know, whatever. This guy was a man, though, right? There was a man. Every day he used to start reading the Tehillim and finish it from cover to cover. Can you imagine? This is a lot of lot of lot of material. I'm talking about 150 chapters in Tehillim. Can you imagine? Every day he reads 150 chapters of Tehillim, the whole book from end to end. So what happened was right that they say it's raining, it's pouring, right? Baruch Hashem, that's good. So they say right that what happened was that um, when this guy died, you know, after he was 120, whatever, he died. So he, they're having his funeral. They say, right, that uh, what happened was that once they started the funeral procession, the Levaya, they saw some big, you know, some strange man over there, you know, who wasn't known to anybody. You know what I mean? So he's riding on a horse, you know, like, uh, whatever, you know. And uh, he looks very majestic, you know, like some very impressive looking man, you know, somebody with very sharp eyes, imposing, you know, you know face, right, countenance, something like this, you know. So uh, they said, uh, they asked this person, you know, they said, excuse me, but who are you? You know, like, where, where did, how did you come to the funeral of this man? Were you his friend or family? Or, who are you? you know? 
they asked him. So he answers them, he says, you know, like this majestic voice. He says, he says, Oh, you know who I am? He says, I'm King David. King David? He says, Yes. He says, I'm King David. He says, Is King David, you 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 passed away three thousand years ago. What's what does it have to do with that? <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> what what's the story, right? So he tells them, he says, you know, I guess you're right, but he says, I came back from the dead. Why? So he says, I was sent back here, you know, to honor this person that died. But they said, you know, but this man was uh, not a rabbi, you know, not something special. He was just a regular Jew, you know, you know, simple, simple Jew. So why do you come to honor him? They said, because he used to read my book every day, you know, to cover, to cover to cover. He says, I had to honor him because of this. This is my book, Tehilim. I was the one who wrote that. So since I wrote that, so I'm coming to honor him, you know. Can you imagine? King David came to his funeral because he was reading the, the Tehilim every day. Something unbelievable, right? So we see from there, right, the greatness of something, of, of a person who gets attached to a certain rabbi. That's whether it was his rabbi, and he saw him personally, and he knows how to envision his countenance, his face, and get in touch with his teaching by studying his books or remembering the things that he learned from him. Or even if he wasn't his rabbi, but the fact that he learns his books on a regular basis, on a daily basis, that rabbi comes and helps him. Can you imagine? Something unbelievable. Uh, I remember, you know, uh, I myself, the, the Zohar Kador seemed to say something, also something very deep about this. You know what it says? That if a person who wants to, you know, there's a custom by religious Jews that they go to the graveyards of the tzaddikim, of the great rabbis, you know, and they pray over there. That they, these, they, should, they should help him. That he should intercede on his behalf, you know, pray to Hashem on his behalf. By the way, you shouldn't make him into a god, you know, like say, oh, you help me. You have to say, you know, go pray for me, you know, not to say he's, don't to treat him like a god. He's not a god, you know, just a, he's, he's a rabbi, you know. We're not from that camp, you know, those guys, you know, who make people into gods. We're not, into, we're, not, we're, not into the, we're not into that stuff, right? So you have to be careful, right, what you say to the person. You should tell him, listen, you know, rabbi, go and pray for me to God, you know, influence, do, exert your influence over there. That's what you should tell him. Don't tell him, oh, you know, uh, you, you're the one who should help me. He cannot help you. What, well, he's God? He's going to help you? What is that gonna, how's he going to help you himself? You know what I mean? That's not the idea. Okay, whatever. You have to know how to do that. Nevertheless, right, uh, they say that when a, the Zohar Kadosh says that when a person comes to the graveyard of the rabbi, of the grave, kever, kever tzaddik of the tzaddik, so what happens is, right, he doesn't even have to go and, and talk to him. That tzaddik already knows what the problem is. They inform him. They have channels over there, you know, all kinds of antennas, all kinds of, all kinds of things going on there, right? All kinds of, uh, right? So what happens is that this tzaddik already knows what, what that person needs. So he starts to pray for him already, even if he doesn't go to him and ask him anything. He already identifies, identifies the problem. You know, that, this is exactly what I remember myself. That one time, you know, I had a certain issue with the government. You know, I had a problem over there. They were giving me a hard time about something. You know. So what happened was that I I, uh, I had a meeting with somebody. I had to go to meet somebody, so I had to go to the north, you know. So I traveled on a bus, and uh, that day happened to be like very close to Lag Bomer, which we just passed, you know, a few weeks ago. So Lag Bomer is the is the death anniversary of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. We talked about that before, right? We spoke about that. So what happened was that it happened to be. I, it wasn't my intention, by the way, but the bus, the last stop where they dropped us off. You know, was right by the grave of Rabbi Shimon. You know, for some reason they dropped us off over there. That wasn't my intention to go there. So what happened was, right, that I got off the bus, and it was right next to the cave where Rabbi Shimon is buried. You know, so I just passed by, and then also later on, as I met my friend over there, somebody that I had to meet over there, he also took me to a different graveyard where there's also a lot of tzaddikim over there, the Arizal, Maran Bet Yosef. Uh, Rabbi Pinchas Ben Yair, all kinds of tzaddikim are buried there. This is the most famous burial site in Eretz Israel, over there in, uh, in Tzfat, in the holy city of Tzfat. So over there also, I went over there, and I didn't go inside, but I just passed by there. You know. So once I did that, I went home. I didn't realize what, even what I was doing, but the fact that I passed by in those places, mm-hmm. you know, you know what happened? The, that problem with the government was solved. Wow. Yeah. In other words, all I had to do was just to pass by there. And also the truth is, right, that these two rabbis that I passed by there, I studied their works as well. You know, I, I studied them. What does that mean? We studied Zohar Kadosh, which is from Rabbi Shimon Yochai. 
Yeah, this is it. This is it. This, this is not the only one. There's 20 volumes like this. Is that? Uh, and then we study the Bet Yosef, which is for Maran Bet Yosef, which I also passed by. So because of that, you understand? Can you imagine? We passed by these two places, and uh, we got a salvation from that. So you, can, you see from there, right, that, that there's a lot of power in this. That a person can ha- also have a rabbi when he's not alive. He can still become his rabbi. But getting in touch with his Torah and also with his, with his, with his facial countenance by visualizing that. This is something unbelievable. If the Zohar Kadosh didn't say that, we couldn't say that, right? So now let's go on a little bit, right? And finish this idea. So it says, right, the uh, Zohar Kadosh, so the first guy, Yosef HaTzadik, he understood from these allusions that we just mentioned, he understood that the first dream was very good. So he interpreted it very well. What does that mean? It was good for him. He was going to get sprung from jail. And also it was going to be good for that guy. He was going to be also sprung from jail and go back to his job as well. Right. But now comes the second guy, right? So once he hears the second guy, that he interpreted very nice everything, so he says, oh, it's going to be like that for me too. Ooh, he's happy, you know? He's leaving with joy. <laughs> so he comes to Yosef Sadiq, right? Tells him, you know what my dream was? So he says, I had a basket on top of my head and there was all kinds of baked goods over there because he was a baker, this guy. Understand? You remember, you remember Baker, right? From the Bush days, right? The Baker, Yimach right? Shimon. So, uh, what do you call it? He was a Baker, this guy. He, he must have been from the same family, probably. This guy was also a Rasha. Just like he was a Rasha, he was also a Rasha. So what happens is like this, right? That uh, uh, he tells him, he said, the birds were coming and eating from the basket. You know, that I, that I had on the top of my head. But these things were meant to, I baked them for Paro. But the birds were coming and, uh, and eating them. So Yosef HaTzadik, once he heard this dream, from the first word already he knew that the dream was going to be bad. How did he know? You know how? Unbelievable, right? Just one word. The first word that he said, this guy, he says, Af, Af, Ani, Bechalomi. So Af, the word first was Af. So once Yosef HaTzadik heard that word, Af, here the word Af, you know what it means according to normal term interpretation? It means also me, also. Af means also. But, but af, the word af in Hebrew also has a different definition. It also can mean the nose, by the way. But here we're not talking about that, right? Af, af also has a meaning of anger, you know, wrath. You know, the wrath. So what does that mean? Once Yosef HaTzadik heard the word af, he said, oh my God, there's wrath on this guy, you know? It's not going to be good this dream. You know, af is wrath. So he said, oh my God. You know? So then he knew already from there, that the whole dream was going to be a shamble, right? So what did he tell him? Once he heard the dream, he told him like this. He said, listen, he says, I'm sorry to tell you, but I don't have good news for you, my friend. Those, those, um, those birds which were coming to eat from your basket on your head, you know what it meant? That Paro is going to take you out of jail. He's going to hang you for the sin that you did. You understand? And he's gonna, the birds are going to be coming and eating your flesh. Your dead body. You know the the uh, those scavengers. You know uh, what I'm talking about, right? Those uh, those birds. So that they eat dead bodies. You know these kind of birds. You know what I'm talking about, Mark. Ravens. The, the bigger ones. I'm talking about. Vultures. Right, vulture. That's the idea. Those things. They know how to eat. Believe me when I tell you, they can eat. They can eat a whole body. No problem. You understand? They, 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 <laughs> they take it, they get a nice meal out of you. You understand? So, so this is <laughs> that's the idea. Well, right? they have to eat something. Uh, don't, don't, but they're big eaters. You understand? They're like they're. They like big boys. They, they, yeah, they can eat a lot. They can eat uh, cows. They eat cows. The whole thing. Yeah, yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, they munch it up. So he told them. He said, "This is what's going to be with you." He says, you, "You're going to be eaten by the birds." You know, he control the birds. <laughs> 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 okay, so my, my feathered friend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the idea. You understand? Is that what I'm so here again, right? What we're seeing is that Yosef Hatzadik was able to interpret these dreams by way of these illusions. But how did he have the sharpness to know all these sharp illusions? Thank you. Thank you. Hazakubaru. Put it down. Put it down. Yes. Put it down. Okay, that's it. How did the. Uh, but how was he able to be so sharp to interpret these things? Would I be able to interpret these things? 
will be able to do it? No, probably not. So how do you know? So it says the Rakadosh, you know how he, how he was able to do this? By visualizing his father, who was his rabbi. And, you know, visualizing his face and also things they learned from him. By contacting him with his visualization, he was able to solve the dream. So it says, you know, you see from here, that's something amazing, right? Zohar Kadosh is teaching you that a person should always try to write to get in touch visually and also mentally with his rabbi, the one he learned Torah from, that, from him. Because this is going to help him to understand something deeper, even though he's not alive anymore. He's already gone, you know? Went to the netherworld. He's not here. But the fact that you do that, you can contact him. It's unbelievable. Okay? This is an amazing, right? So now we understand, right, that what? That when it says, the verse says, This is something very deep, right? What does that mean, this verse? That you should be looking at your teacher, the one who teaches you Torah. Look at him. Why is that? Because the visual contact that you have with your rabbi is going to elevate you. It's going to make you into a different person. That holy influence that you get from him it elevates you into a different level altogether. I can tell you, by the way, myself also. 100%. There's no question about it. Once I started to look at the rabbi, who was, I'm telling you, I'm not joking with it when I tell you this. No exaggeration. He was like Moshe Rabbeinu, this man. No less, no more. Of this generation, he was Moshe Rabbeinu. Right? They say, by the way, the Chazal, this is not just a joke, by the way, this thing. They say that every great rabbi, leader of the generation, of each generation, is a Gilgul, is, is a reincarnation of Moshe Rabbeinu. So, Kadosh Baruch Hu, to create on Moshe Rabbeinu, he has to come back in every generation, be the leader of the generation. Every time, the leader of the generation is Moshe Rabbeinu. Until Mashiach. Right? They say, right, he is the first redeemer, and he's also the final redeemer. Do you really believe he was Moses? Ah, I'm sorry? Really no question about it. We felt it, you know? It was, it was, it's just like we felt like we were sitting on Har Sinai, on Mount Sinai, learning from him. It was such an elevation. No. The truth is, you know, the there was the elevation of hearing his Torah, which was also very great. But perhaps even greater was the elevation of just looking at him, you know? Oh, my God. It was sight for, sight for sore eyes. How long did he live? He was 93 years old when he died. I was Zohar to be with him for 15 years. A lot of long time. You know? Can you imagine? So, what I can tell you is like this, right? I just used to go to his lectures sometimes just to look at him, you know? You know why? Because when I would look at him, I, I was a pathetic, you know, specimen myself, you know, nothing, nobody, you know, but when I would see him, this person was complete in his faith in God, no doubts by him, you know, like, we always discuss these things, like, do you really believe that, you know, we talk about that, right, do you really believe, so, you know, this rabbi, you know, he really believed everything that he said, it wasn't just some kind of a theoretical lesson, you know what I mean, so when you see somebody like that, was perfect in his faith. It's a tr it's a tremendous elevation that elevates you as well, and you you get that faith also. Yeah. Yourself, you understand? You connect with that. So this is an Egyptian amazing sandals. thing, you understand? Well, Egyptian sandals. <laughs> was he a down to earth guy? Yeah, very down to earth, but also very majestic. You know, yeah. very. Yeah. Too, he had both of those qualities. Yeah. You know what I mean? He was also he had that. Two dual, dual, you know, kind of thing. Down to earth and also very lofty. But also he was, you know, in terms of his personality. Who took over for him? His son. Uh, his son took over. He's now the chief rabbi. Rabbi Yitzchak Yosef. Chief right. rabbi in Israel. So, uh, we don't have somebody like on his level, but, Eliezer. you know, we don't have somebody like that. Right here, Yasha, right here. Okay. You understand, you really, guys? So, we see from here, it's an amazing thing about Tai. That a person, you know, these rabbis, these great rabbis, these great chachamim, that we were, if we were Zohar to learn with them, these great people, this is our connection with God. You know, we connect, we, we connect through their greatness the with God. Knows what to do. Ah, okay. <laughs> He's a leader. <laughs> okay. Of the lost souls. So, this is the idea about Tai. That a person connects with, with, Hashim, with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, can you imagine? Goes into the deepest, deepest parts of the Torah mm -hmm. by visualizing and analyzing what his rabbi said, whether he wrote it in a book, or whether he said it in a lecture, or whether he had a private audience with him, whatever it is. This is unbelievable. 
So a person connected with his, can connect with his rabbi also after he dies. You know, people people ask me right sometimes like they you know what about you you know who's your rabbi you know I tell them I said listen you think after having a rabbi like that I can have somebody else? Mm-hmm. It's like to me after having a rabbi like that everybody else is like a play-doh. Excuse me, you know, excuse the vision. It's like play-doh. But anyway, we do consult with rabbis sometimes. You know, there are rabbis who are very knowledgeable. We know them. We consult with them. You know, sometimes if we need to consult, we consult. But you're already on yeah. a level where you know what what's right. Hopefully, I, ho- I hope you're right. What can I tell you, right? You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I hope you're right. So the point is that a person, right, uh, doesn't have to now compromise anymore. Yosef at Sadiq, he didn't say now, okay, wait a second, you know, my father's not here, my rabbi. So you know what? I'll go to a different rabbi, Egyptian rabbi, you know? I go to the priests over there, the Egyptian priests. What is that going to help you, right, going to these losers? Right? You have to go to somebody who knows, who knows Torah, you know what I mean? So, uh, <laughs> right? So therefore, right, what he, did, what he did was he was able to connect with his rabbi even though he's not there. This is an unbelievable thing. You know what, Mark? I yeah. wish they weren't losers. I, I wish we had more of those rabbis. But unfortunately, we don't. We have uh, losers. Okay. Yeah, we have losers. Yeah, okay. Know. No, actually, they're not losers because they're making a lot of money. They're winning a lot of no, money. No, they're no, winning no, the no, lottery. No, they're getting no, the jackpot. No, 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 yeah. You know what I mean, right? Okay. Let's get the idea. So anything that we retire, this is an amazing thing. <coughs> so therefore, the bottom line, right? I'm going to let you guys go, right? The bottom line is like this. That a person, every person should, because of this, have right a rabbi that he learns Torah from and he asks questions, you know, and gets clarity from him and so forth and so on, and this can right, lead him also to go into more higher levels. You know, when we started out, right, to study, when we were young, we had, you know, those rabbis, you know, who were then, you know what I mean? But, you know, those rabbis were not qualified to lead us to the higher levels, you know what I mean? They, were, they themselves were not so great. So then we had to attach ourselves to different rabbis, you know, this is the way it is. Once a person gets really devoted to Torah, the Gosh Baruch takes them to better rabbis, you know, higher level rabbis, more God-fearing rabbis. You get, you get, you know, promoted. You get a promotion. You know, you go from this place and you go now to the higher, le- higher level you Ivy League. You know, you go to the Ivy Leagues. You know, they have to do this. Stuff. This is the way it is. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. Yeah, we used to. We used to. Uh, we had a little contact together. You know. Yeah, you know and, uh, and how would you rate him? Uh, well, you know, as we said, right? There's there's beginning and there's intermediate and yes, advanced. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we were going, you know, eventually up the ladder, you know, little by little. That was the beginning, you know, that was the beginning part. And then we had to, we had to go to more different levels, you know what I mean? Yeah. The different, this is yeah. different level. I found him <coughs> to be, I found him to be a, a great guy, a very good soul, obviously. I found him to be troubled himself, <laughs> in himself. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. I found okay. him to be a man uh, somewhat confused. Uh, and you remember, I don't know if you were you were a newcomer back then when me and Ruben were going, but in one of the seminars he said, you know, guys, when I was young and I, I was going through my troubles, whatever, I used to call people in the middle of the night, my friends, whatever, and I used to tell them my problems, you know, before I became closer to God, thinking that people were going to solve my problems. And, I realize nobody is able to solve your problem. I'll tell you something really funny. You want, you want to hear something really funny? Uh, we'll stop it with this, right? That uh, Regarding this rabbi you mentioned, he met up with me also in Jerusalem when I was there. You know, he used to come and study with me. Yeah. We used to study together. Yes. So uh, one time we were studying together in my shiva. You know, he came there. He used to come. We also studied in Manhattan, by the way, before I went to Israel. Okay. Yeah. We studied a lot together. Yeah. Yeah. We had like a friendship, you know? We used to go and go to the restaurants and hang out. And we had yeah, all kinds of yeah. things. So what happened was that uh, one time we were staying in my yeshiva. So then upstairs the rabbi came, Allah Shalom Maran. He came to teach the lecture there. You know? So he was a great rabbi. Everybody knew him. You know who he was. Whatever, you know? so I told I told him, rabbi, 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 this rabbi you mentioned. I told him, I said, uh, you know what? He just came. You know, the rabbi upstairs. Go get a blessing from him. You know, yeah. It's very worthwhile for you. You know. <laughs> so he told me, he says, okay, I'll go, you know. So I, goes upstairs. I stayed downstairs. I didn't want to go up there, you know. So uh, he goes up there, you know, and uh, like five minutes later, comes back. <laughs> you know? So funny things like this, right? I have to tell you a little bit of background information. You don't understand what, what's the story over here, right? The rabbi used to have a, a, 
a habit, right? He had this like that the, whoever came to him, you know, to get a blessing, he would give him like a big smack in the face, you know, like Dah! like this, you know. We used to get smacked all the time by the rabbi. He used to beat us up, you know, like tuh, 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 tuh. he had like a pretty good hands, you know, like boxer's hands. You know, so everybody got like, you know, beat up by the rabbi. Smacked. We got a smack. We loved that, you know, we it was like affection, you know, whatever. <laughs> so what happened was right that this guy, Lazar, you know, he he wasn't expecting that. You know what I mean? He, so oh, he, he wasn't, you know, expecting. Yeah. So what happens like this, right? So he uh, I mean he knew about it, but he didn't realize it was gonna come on his own, you know. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so what happened was like this, right? So he goes up there and he comes back down. So I said, Did the rabbi bless you? So he says, Yeah, he says he blessed me, he says, but he says, you know, he says, you almost you almost knocked my head off. He says, he says, he hit me so hard. <laughs> he almost knocked my head off. <laughs> Why did I tell you that, right? Because, uh, right, he used to do that to everybody. You know, that's the way it was, right? But uh, this was a confection by the rabbi, you understand? So even though, you know, as we, st- we started out with this one, but then we went to that one, and we also got this one to go to that one. Understand? So everything came out good. Sure, sure. <laughs> that's the way it is, you understand? Because there's a hierarchy, you understand? There's a hierarchy in Torah, you know? Yeah. There's this level, there's that level, you know, you go to from, you jump from one level to another. That's the way it is. You know, you start out with the local rabbis, and then when you're already too great to learn with them, you're on a higher level already. Yeah. So Hashem will take you to a better place. That's the way it is. How would you rate these guys, these two? You, we talked about that already. <laughs> okay, so that's the idea. Okay, thanks for coming, about Tai. God bless you, and come uh, next time, come with some caffeine. Come alert next time. Okay, yalla. I heard every word, even though my head.